All right, so everybody remembers to complete exploratory reflection one for tonight, right? Now for Thursday, you're gonna be completing assignment five on page 177 of writing analytically. Um, and I just want everybody to turn there quickly so we all know what we're doing, right? So the instructions tell you to write a paper following the template for organizing papers using 10 on one. Now you will find that template on page 173. So try to use that as a model. And you're going to be using reflection one as your starting point, right? So I will grade reflection one tomorrow, right? You'll, you'll have that by tomorrow afternoon. And what you're going to be doing is revising and expanding upon that for this assignment. So I'm going to want um, you know, so exploratory reflection one is 500 words. I'm going to want 1,000 words for this. And then what this is going to provide is the basis for your draft of paper one, which we're going to work on all next week, right? So next Tuesday, so a week from today, what we're going to do is go to the computer lab, and you're going to have a day to write in class. So bring your materials with you. Um, you, know, you can ask me questions while you're working. You can ask me to come look at things for you, things like that, right? Um, and part of the reason we do this is because I've just, I found through experience that if I give students time to write in class, more students end up turning in the assignment. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm all that worried about that with this group. You guys have been good about this so far, but nonetheless. And then um, I think next Thursday, we were supposed to have a peer review session but even with this smaller group, under pandemic conditions, that's, that's hard. And online peer reviews tend to suck. So what we're going to do instead are just sort of short individual conferences. Like we'll, we'll, talk, we'll schedule a time on Blackboard when we would normally be here in class uh, for each of you individually. It'll be about 15 to 20 minutes, and we'll talk over your paper, OK? So there's no class on Thursday? Uh, this Thursday, yes, class. Next Thursday, no. Yes. <laughs> yeah, next week we won't meet here on Thursday. We'll have an individual conference instead. Okay. Any other, so any questions about any of this stuff? Take a minute, think about it. By the way, the reason I haven't given you a formal assignment sheet yet for paper one is because you're already working on it. So I will give you a formal assignment sheet on Thursday. Right? The draft will be due next week, and then the final version of paper one will be due after spring break. So for the thousand word assignment five, we're uh -huh. using the steps from 10 on one. Yep. To yep, that is okay. exactly what you are to do. And is it a new is it a new thousand word? Like we're not adding to our exploratory you, reflection. You can incorporate material from the exploratory reflection. Right, but we're right? not like taking what we have and just adding five. Yeah, words. yeah, yeah. Don't just add five hundred words. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, I want you to first respond to the like you know, do your best to revise according to the comments that I make, right? Mm -hmm. You'll have all that tomorrow. Um, and then um, yeah, it, it should still be a thousand words, but like my, my point is here is that you won't be starting from scratch, right? right? You will already probably have noticed some kind of pattern that you want to talk about, so this will give you a starting point. All right, any other questions? Okay, then today what I want to talk about is the distinction between claim and evidence and what to do with claim and evidence in your papers. Right, so what do these terms mean? What is a claim and what is evidence? Statement. <clears throat> okay. How you feel about something, I guess. I mean, not necessarily how you feel, but. Yes. You're, you're, I feel well. like it's kind of how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and the, the context I would usually think about this is, of course, be like a legality issue. So okay. I think a claim would be more of like an allegation. It would be like, well, here's what I say happened. And then evidence okay. would be what confirms said claim. 
Okay. So you need evidence to confirm. Okay, and that is the way we typically think about a claim, or is it something we need evidence to confirm? I'd like us to actually kind of toss that aside for a moment because I, I want to come at this from a different angle. Um, one that I think will be overall more useful to you um, in your studies generally and in everyday life, right? So the way we tend to think um, in our classes about how reasoning works is a model that we call deductive reasoning. Anybody familiar with this term? Anybody know what deductive reasoning is? I have heard it. It's like using what you already know to reason. Yeah. Sort of. I don't know. So deductive reasoning starts with a general principle that you apply to a specific case. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we talked about syllogisms? Right? <clears throat> All humans are mortal. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Socrates is human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Yeah, the syllogism is the classic example of deductive reasoning, right? We start with a general principle. and we then apply a particular case. Thus proving the general principle, right? The problem with deductive reasoning is that we start with the general principle already in place, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the reasoning that we actually have to do day to day, whether in our classes or outside of it, doesn't work that way. Most of the reasoning we actually have to do is called inductive. And inductive reasoning essentially works from the opposite way, right? You are generating a general principle from observation of specific cases. And so you're looking at a set of data and you're trying to find elements of commonality within that data to help you make sense of it, right? Some general principle that explains the data. So when we talk about claim and evidence, what we really mean here by evidence and actually, this is like, I know that the textbook uses the word evidence. I actually kind of prefer to use the word data because I think it's a bit more neutral. When we talk about data, we're talking about statements that are objectively true on their own. Right? So if it's something you could look up to test the truth or falsehood of it, it's probably data, right? It's probably evidence. A claim, on the other hand, is an interpretation of data. So I think, yeah, you, you, were, you were thinking along the right lines, Grace, and you said, well, it's more how you feel about something. Although I would say it's really more what you think about something. Um, but yeah, a claim is not objectively true on its own. It does require data to back it up. But the reason I frame it as interpretation is because I want you to think of the data as coming first, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to kind of generate a thesis or generate an argument and then just pick data that fits the pre-existing argument, right? I want you to sit with the evidence, examine it, and generate a claim from interpreting that evidence, right? 
this is what most of your instructors and most of your courses are actually going to want, whether they say so or not. So, <clears throat> um, where was I going with this? I lost my train of thought again. This, this is happening a lot more lately as I get older. Um, so, right. Particularly true, interpretation. Okay, so what I'd like to try to do first is make sure that, oh, no, right, this is what I want to say. The, the basic model of the exploratory reflection is an inductive model, right? You start with your quote, you closely observe the quote, you pick it apart, and then at the end of this, you're supposed to come to a bigger claim, right? You're supposed to come to, uh, you know, to a working thesis statement. So yeah, so, yeah, so think, think of this as an inductive exercise, right? Okay, so let's see how good we are at recognizing the difference between claim and evidence. So I'm going to put some examples on the board, most of which are going to be drawn um, from early 20th century uh, cultural criticism because, well, that's the shit that I work on, so um, <laughs> that's what I have to have lined to hand when I need examples. So, the first example is actually not, uh, this is actually sort of taken from history. So, Andrew Jackson forcibly displaced the Cherokee from their lands in Georgia and sent them to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. And then the second sentence, Jackson's policy toward Native Americans was racist. Which is the claim and which is the evidence? Yeah, this is the claim, right? This is an interpretation of a historical fact, right? This is also something, like another way that we recognize a claim, right, is that if it is something that could be interpreted in multiple ways, right? If it's something that, that people could agree or disagree with. Well, no, if it's something that people could disagree with, right? So, yes, this, uh, that is correct. That is, the, that is the claim, that is the evidence. Okay, so the second one that I'm gonna give you is from a book by George Orwell called The Road to Wigan Pier. So it was written in the 30s. Um, Orwell was in the north of England observing uh, working and living conditions for miners. I mean miners, M-I-N-E-R-S, as in people who work in mines, not miners as in people under the age of 18. So the first statement is middle class people <coughs> are fond of saying that the miners wouldn't wash themselves even if they could but this is nonsense and the second sentence is where pithead baths exist, practically all the men use them. <clears throat> pithead baths being uh, bathing facilities that would be right at the mine. 
Which is the claim and which is the evidence? The claim is the top one. Okay, well, uh, why do you think the top one is the claim? Uh, because it says they're fond of saying that the miners wouldn't wash themselves even if they could, but then okay. you have an evidence that where, where they exist, probably uh -huh. all men use them when they fall in, include miners. Okay. Then yeah, so yeah, you yeah, this, this is the evidence, right? Right. But what is the actual claim that's being made? That they don't, that don't, they don't bathe. What's that? that they, yeah, that they don't use that. Is that the actual claim that Orwell is making? Or is it the claim that middle class people are fond of saying? Yeah, see, it's a little complicated, right? It's a claim about a claim, right? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So what he's doing is presenting here the claim that these middle class people make, right? So this is a claim. But this is not. Okay. Yeah, right. that's also a claim, right? So he's claiming that what these people say is bullshit, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then because of this piece of evidence. evidence. Exactly. What they said. Yeah. It's a claim counterclaim situation. And you know, when you see something like, but this is nonsense, right? That should also be a giveaway that this is a claim, right? Okay, next example. This is from an essay by the German art critic Walter Benjamin called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. He was talking about uh, the way our ability to use machines to reproduce works of art, particularly you know, say recorded music, things like that, changes the way we view uh, the individual work of art. So, first sentence. The Greeks knew only two procedures for technically reproducing works of art. Founding and stamping. And the second sentence, mechanical reproduction of a work of art represents something new. Which is the evidence, which is the claim? Is the top one for technically reproducing? I mean, I don't know. I just saw the word technically, and that seems I feel like the claims might be more opinionated. Okay, so I, I think like what, what what's 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 tripping you up here? I think is the uh, the ambiguous meaning of the word technically, right? Yeah. Because they're saying like with technology. Yeah. Not yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Greeks no, knew only um, two procedures for <laughs> using technology to reproduce works of art. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think the bottom one's a claim just because uh, it says, uh, like, that's kind of opinion based. Like, I mean, that's, I think that's up for debate whether it's new or not, just because it's been reproduced. Okay, and does this seem to follow from, like, okay, like, th this, okay, does this seem to follow from what's above here? That, okay, if, if, this, if these historical peoples, only knew these two ways of reproducing a work of art, then mechanical reproduction must represent something new, right? right. So we can, so because it follows in that way, we can see yeah, that this is an interpretation, right, of this. So yeah, this is the evidence, and this is the name. All right, I'm gonna give you one more, and then we're gonna move on to something else. This is from uh, a book called Black Skin, White Masks by a psychoanalyst from Martinique by the name of Franz Fanon, who was talking about, uh, he was writing about the role of um, Africans in uh, French society around the middle of the 20th century, right? 
So in particular from uh, you know, people who came from countries that France had colonized. So the first sentence is, in the French colonial army, the black officers served first of all as interpreters. And the second sentence, the colonized is elevated above his status in proportion to his adoption of the mother country's cultural standards. Which is the claim and which is the evidence? Okay, yeah, let, let's, let, let, let's try to think about it this way, right? Which of these two could you look up to verify? The top. Yeah. Which is why so I what does that tell us? That's, That's the evidence, yep. Yeah, if you had access to French colonial army records, right, you could look up what jobs were assigned uh, to black officers, right? Mm -hmm. The second is the claim, yeah, because it's an interpretation of this fact, right? Yeah, um, good rule of thumb, right? If you can look it up to verify it, it's evidence, right? If it sounds like an interpretation of a fact, it's a claim. But there is a third kind of statement you might run into that doesn't fall easily into the claim evidence uh, dichotomy. So, <clears throat> One of the things that most instructors want their students doing is not just backing up claims of evidence, but also explaining to us the, the connecting logic between the claim you're making and the evidence that you're citing, right? How did you get there from here, right? How did you reach this interpretation from this piece of evidence. What is the connecting logic? So I want to introduce you to a method for testing this or figuring this out by a philosopher of language and rhetorician by the name of Stephen Toulmin. So what Toulmin did was essentially modify the old form of the syllogism um, to better draw out the logical connections between claim and evidence. So in the full-on Toulmin method, there are about eight elements that you're looking for. We are going to be looking at three elements, a much more basic simplified model, right? So according to Toulmin, using the simplified model, a, like there, are, there are essentially three parts of an argument, right? There's the claim, The grounds, which is essentially the same thing as data or evidence, it's just the word he uses for it. And what he calls the warrant. And the warrant is the connecting logic that justifies making this claim based on these grounds, right? Is that like claim evidence reasoning in a way? Yeah. Yeah, that would actually that would actually be a good way to think of this. Yeah. yeah. So for example. If I was to make the claim, I am a US citizen, 
On what grounds do I make this claim? I was born in Pennsylvania. What's my warrant for making this claim based on these grounds? Pennsylvania is part of the United States. Pennsylvania is in the U.S. and? And I was born there. Uh, well, I guess being born in the U.S. warrants citizenship. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, anyone born on U.S. soil is a citizen. by provision of the 14th Amendment, right? So we understand how this works, right? So let me give you a couple of examples. So um, I'm going to frame this first one by stating that I don't know anything about sports, right? I don't know anything at all about any sport. I don't really, I barely know the rules of most sports. I don't know which teams are good. And I have chosen the particular team that I'm working with here because they were really good when I was a kid which is the last time I seriously followed baseball. Um, so I have no idea if they're still good. So, you know, don't take this as uh, you know, my, my reading of the actual sports landscape, okay? Because I know fuck all about it. So the claim I'm going to make here is that the Detroit Tigers will win the World Series. Grounds for this is that they have the best pitching in the league. Now, what would be the warrant connecting this claim to this grounds? Pitching is a vital part of the game, right? Yeah. You know, like you say, like because mm -hmm. the pitching is good, they will win the World Series. Yeah. So, so what the are, importance of pitching is what makes that. Exactly. So yeah, I'm not just suggesting here that pitching is important. I'm suggesting it's the most important, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. That pitching is the most important element of the game. But again, take anything I say about any sport with a grain of salt, or several grains of salt. Okay, so, second example. <clears throat> I'm going to draw from the world of politics, because nobody fights about politics, right? Although, you know, I'm going to make an ideologically neutral claim here, so, all right. So, I'm going to argue that the Democratic Party should hold their next convention in Milwaukee. My grounds for this is that the party narrowly lost Wisconsin in 2016 and barely won the state in 2020. Now, what would my warrant be? for making this claim based on these grounds. What's the connecting logic here? Because the state is a swing, I guess you, know, you would say swing state. It's mm -hmm. susceptible to change, so to hold your convention there would sway the odds more. Yeah, so uh, what I'm suggesting about conventions, right, generally, is that conventions should be held in swing states that you need to win, right? right? So let's try one more, and then we're going to uh, work on a little exercise. 
Is it restroom before we continue that? Yeah, you can, yeah, you can, yeah, you, you, you can, you can get up and get, we're all adults, you can get yeah. up and yeah, go use know. the restroom whenever you want. Just, you know, not right here. Yeah. Okay, so, plane. We're going to talk about medieval English poetry here, right? So Beowulf shows a culture... in transition from warrior-focused paganism to Christianity. My grounds for this is that the poem includes Sympathetic portrayals of pagan warriors alongside warnings against pagan practices. So what's my warrant for making this claim based on this evidence? This one's probably a little trickier. What assumption and what assumption and what yeah, what assumption Am I making about the relation about art and literature here? In relation to culture. What was the question? What assumption am I, what assumption am I making about art and literature here and its relationship to culture? So, like I said, this 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 one is a little bit trickier, right? So, the so yeah, so 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 the basic warrant here for connecting this claim to this ground is that conflicts and contradictions within a culture often find expression. in that culture's art and literature, right? Okay, so what I'd like to do now um, is try to work on generating claims from a set of evidence that you haven't seen before, right? So I have a handout that I'm going to give you. And we're going to spend the rest of the class working on an exercise. So the first thing I want you to do as you go through uh, these uh, points of evidence here, right, all of which are taken from the same book, and all of which you will see have to do with urban design and urban planning. 
you're going to look for patterns, right? You're going to look for strands, right? The, you know, similarities that connect things to each other. You're going to look for binaries, right? That is, you know, patterns of contrast. And you're going to look for things that don't quite seem to fit any pattern, right? If there's anything in here that seems strange or like it doesn't fit with anything else. What you're going to do then is use these patterns uh, to try to come up with at least three separate claims about the evidence. Now, in order to make a good strong claim, right, a claim is strong if it is specific. if it is arguable, right, that is, if it is possible for someone else to come to a different interpretation, right, and if it accounts for multiple pieces of evidence. Right? The more pieces of evidence you can account for while still keeping your claim specific, the stronger the claim is, right? Now, a weak claim is often vague or wishy-washy, or is supported by very little evidence. So a claim that you can support with three pieces of evidence is going to be stronger than a claim that you can support with only one piece of evidence, right? So these are, you know, this is how I want you thinking as you go through this, right? So go through it. For now, just look for patterns. And then we, uh, yeah, do note that, yeah, the sheet is two sides. There are things on the back side as well. Um, and in, say, say, 10 minutes, we'll come back and talk about what you've found so far, OK? No, no, not for each sentence. So, so, each of these sentences is a separate piece. Sentences is a separate piece of evidence. So what you want to do is try to come up with claims that can incorporate more than one of these pieces of evidence, right? But first, just go ahead and look for patterns. Right? Look for things that connect these pieces of evidence to each other. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I should hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Generally speaking, if I give you a handout, I don't expect it back.
suburban. Uh huh. And urban, which one's which? Okay, so urban would be like think of like a traditional dense city. Uh, -huh. uh suburban. Um, it's more like secluded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think think of like it's not rural, but like housing developments in cul-de-sacs. And um, you know things basically being not not close to each other, right? This would be like this would be more rural generally, right? Although even like if we look at Americas, right, we do have like a central town, right? right. Um, so yeah, when we talk about suburban, yeah, we're, we're basically talking about a pattern of development. It's usually outside of a city. Um, so like think of like most of what's up like outside of Atlanta, right? Um, kind of everything's off of, you know, like everything's off of the highways. Um, nothing is all that close to each other. Um, yeah, it's, it's adjacent to the city, but not in the city, right? I have a question. Yeah. Um, it says evidence. Uh, in the late 1990s, children of educated middle class suburban families started moving to large cities like New York, Boston, and San Francisco. Uh huh. It says children of. So did the families move as well, or is this just. Just the children. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, just the children? Yep. Okay. Parents stayed put. So, 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 like, think of like recent college graduates, right? Like, not, you know, oh, okay. yeah, not, not, not like eight year olds. It's not like, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take three minutes with this. Remember, you're just identifying patterns now and not going any further yet, right?
So how do we do it, everybody? What do we got? Let's start with strands. What strands did you notice? What patterns of similarity? Um, the one that has to do with uh, the transition from walking to driving, I guess. Okay, uh, explain. Um, well, it, is, it says American homes built before 1950 rarely had attached garages or carports, and it says developed afterwards rarely had sidewalks. Okay. Seeing as if they make the transition. Uh, also, it says suburban neighborhoods rarely offer public transportation, which leads me to the claim that most children in suburban neighborhoods didn't have access to it because it says most uh -huh. American children grow up in suburban neighborhoods, and if they don't have public transportation, or most of them don't have access, then most of them didn't receive public transportation. Okay. So yeah, so transportation access is a definite strand that runs through a lot of these, right? What other strands did you guys notice? There's patterns of similarity. Like the peak of, uh, I guess, more commercialism, because it, it talks about how older cities um, have like a grid system, and then newer ones kind of feed to a single road. And from the 1960s to 1990s, retail and commercial development moved from traditional centralized downtowns to highway strip malls, industrial parks, and enclosed shopping malls. Okay, so, so does that necessarily mean a change in the level of commercialism or just in the places where it happens? In the places, but it says in this right here, walking more driving. And after uh -huh. that, I get, because I'm guessing when cars started becoming more and more prevalent, then, you know, people could, you could kind of feed people more mm -hmm. money. Okay, yeah, cars are definitely a, um, talks about property too, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was kind of confused on that. Because on the back, it, you know, it talks about the varying difference and it's urban and suburban ideas of what private, what, what private commodity means. Mm -hmm. But it okay. says on the front something about that too. Yeah. Land laws regard land as a private commodity. But I, I thought that might have been an anomaly until I read the back, and then I was like, well, maybe we can make a connection there. Kind of okay. What have you, what have you guys got? With the, because I numbered them, so the last piece of evidence and uh -huh. the second piece of evidence, oh, you know, the, like the third, how um, okay. uh, about like the private commodity and the people getting, they oppose the like, building of new housing and stuff like that. Okay. People getting like make decisions about what the neighborhood would look like instead of it just being okay. a place for them and they have to just choose from what they are. Okay. Okay, seclusion. Good. What other patterns of similarity did you notice? Let's talk about contrasts here. What binaries did you guys pick up here? I got a lot about like how. So in American homes built before 1950 rarely have attached garages or carports. Uh -huh. American neighborhoods developed after 1950 rarely have sidewalks. So okay, good. I feel like the house, the homes before 1950, like the need for cars wasn't as expanded as like uh -huh. it was after 1950, which made, which provides evident or reasoning why there would be rarely any sidewalks as opposed to okay. before 1950 where there were no no garages really okay so, so yeah. cars mm -hmm. the demand for cars been the need for sidewalks or and it says the demand, uh, yeah the demands for cars affected the development of the neighborhoods and houses okay so there's a definite pre-1950 versus post-1950 yeah. right? right and is there another uh, implied binary here with the whole garages and sidewalks thing. Uh, in terms of how people get around. The garage, uh, no, no, no. Well, I was just going to yeah. say that it's as large as the living space in the new age, so obviously it's, you know, it seems as if the importance of it is close to the same. Yeah, so we got a driving versus walking binary there too, right? Um, I would say like urban versus suburban because they seem okay. to have conflicting ideas on a lot of them. Sure. Like one gets uh, transportation, one doesn't, one uh, 
like uh, right here, suburban neighborhoods often oppose the building of new houses, while urban neighborhoods and traditional usually include a mix of commercial, mm -hmm. government, and residential. Sure. It's a property, I think, there's a big uh, Okay. So, so yeah, yeah, we can also maybe like a private versus public mm -hmm. contrast, or public versus private. Okay, yeah, what else? What else do we see as potential contrasts or binaries here? difference we see between suburban and urban development in the U.S.? Which tends to be newer and which tends to be older? Yeah, think about that. Like, what's most of the stuff that are, that's being built after 1950? Is most of that suburban or urban? Yeah, so when we're looking Wait, what at the. Was the question before or after? Yeah, what, yeah, what, what, what's mo yeah, is most of what's being built after 1950, does this suggest that most of that is suburban or urban? Yeah, so the newer stuff is suburban, suburban. right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. The big ass garages. Um, what about these things about children here? Right? For example, we've got this thing about children growing up in suburban neighborhoods. But then do they choose to live there as adults? No. From what this is. Yeah, what this at, least, at, least, at least in the early 90s when this is published, they were not, right? Like, so, you know, recent college grads were moving en masse uh, to cities rather than going back out to the suburbs. So there might also be a generational divide here, right? That, you know, say like what the baby boomers wanted when they were, you know, moving out, striking out on their own is, you know, different from what their Gen X or millennial offspring wanted, right? So there might be a kind of generational divide implied here as well. Um, what about anomalies? Did you guys notice anything that didn't seem to fit with anything else? The first piece, I mean, kind of, you know, the 80% of everything built in America was built after 1945, but it doesn't really talk about the other 20%. Like, okay, well, about that. well, 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 um, let, let's, let's, we actually can relate this, uh, I think, to the other stuff, right? If we look at this pre-1950 versus post-1950 right. divide, right? Right. So what does that suggest most of the construct post-1945 construction is? Urban or suburban? It's urban, suburban. Yeah, that, so that suggests that just about 80% of everything built in America, right? Now, like every existing building in America, in America is suburban, right? Okay, what, what's, yeah, what, what seems weird about that? It's talking about tourist destinations and how cars are not permitted. I mean, I, like, I understand that, like, cars are kind of, rel like, extremely relevant to all of the evidence. Uh -huh. Like, I don't understand how cars, like, how cars being uh -huh. permitted at Disney World have anything to do with the okay. Because like, I mean, does, is it talking? Sorry. No, no, you're fine. You're is talking. it talking about how cars like you can't drive cars at Disney World around? Yeah, you, you basically like, yeah, you, you, yeah, you you have to park outside, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And then you have to when you're in the park, you have to walk everywhere. Okay, right. so I guess it's like kind of. So yeah, well, yeah, let, 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 let's. I mean, we might think of this actually in terms of how we spend our leisure time, right? Versus how we spend our ordinary everyday working lives, right? Um, given all this other evidence, right? If you live in the suburbs, how close do you probably live to where you work? No. Probably not, not very, right? Places. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you will you you would probably and given the lack of public transportation, how do you probably have to get to work? Yeah. So when you are on vacation how likely is it that you are going to want to sit in the car for long periods of time? Not, not very likely. Yeah, because that's what you do all the fucking week, 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So, that, so what this suggests, right, is that you know, when, you know, while we may value cars culturally, particularly in the latter half of the 20th century, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we like them. Right. Right. We, we don't necessarily buy cars, buy cars or drive our own cars because we enjoy it. We do so because the landscape we live in, we live in says that we have to, right? So what I'd like you guys to do, now, we've got a good selection of stuff up here now, right? So what I want you to do is you're, you're already doing some work tying these things together, right? I want you to take a little bit of time and I want you to see if you can come up with at least three good claims, right? that account for multiple pieces of evidence. And remember up here, like what makes for a strong claim, right? So it might, you know, a good place to start is by looking at these patterns that we've already identified, right? And pieces of evidence you can fit into these patterns and arguments you might be able to make about these patterns, what they mean.
Okay, so has everybody got three claims or do you need a little more time? Two. Okay. Yeah, take another couple of minutes. If we don't finish this today, we'll just pick it up at the beginning of next class. How are we doing? Everybody got three? Yeah. Three yeah. Okay, so what I want you all to do now is take another couple of minutes and rank your three from strongest to weakest, right? Think about these criteria here, right? Is it specific? Is it arguable? How much evidence does it account for, right? <clears throat>
Okay, Rylan, what was your strongest claim? Um, my second claim, the, the need to drive everywhere is a direct result of suburban development. Okay. Grace, tell me your best claim. The production of cars changed the development of suburban neighborhoods. Okay. Production of cars changed the development of suburban neighborhoods. Good. Corbin. Circa 1950 was an era of automotive growth. All right. All right, overall, yeah, good work, guys. Good start on these. So what we're going to do, um, so we're about out of time for today, right? So sit on these till next time, right? Rem you know, keep these, remember them, remember which, which, which ones you chose, right? And the beginning of next class, we'll work on these to see how you could develop something like this into uh, a viable thesis statement, right? Um, but yeah, otherwise we are done for the day, and we'll see you Thursday. <laughs>